Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining this, uh, the Future of Innovation breakout session, which is obviously the best breakout session. So uh, you picked wisely. Um, we'll just do a few introductions and we've got a couple of little slides just to contextualize the groups that are co-hosting this and then we'll move straight on to the discussion. Um, it's difficult always over virtual formats, but I'm keen to make it as interactive as possible. So if you have any comments or questions or uh, interesting things to say, please do type it in and I'll try and field them uh, to the panel that we have with me today. So uh, hi, I'm Will. I'm one of the uh, uh, surgical researchers from Leeds. I also work for the Association of Surgeons in Training as their innovation lead, and I'm one of the co-founders of the MedTech Foundation. So these are the two groups that are co-hosting this one. So I'll just, uh, in I'll just uh, get the colleagues to introduce themselves and I'll go in the order that they appear on my screen. So Angela, can you tell me who you are, please? Tell everyone who you are. Hi everyone, uh, my, my name is Angela. I'm the National Director of the MedTech Foundation. Uh, I'm also a foundation doctor uh, working in the East Anglia region at the moment. Great, thanks Angela. And uh, Will Foster. Hi everyone, uh, I'm a, uh, an medical and PhD student at Cambridge. Um, I interpreted with a degree in engineering. Um, I am the National Operations Director of the MedTech Foundation and I also uh, along with Manuela, who is here but having some technical difficulties at the moment, uh, run the innovation program that we run in Cambridge, which I'll tell you more about in a sec. Yeah, we should do an innovation program about how to get on to hop in uh, successfully the first time. Um, thanks. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, Martin King. Um, thanks, Will. My name is Martin King. I'm a core surgical trainee in Northern Ireland, but I'm the National Secretary for the Association of Surgeons in Training. And I also am the deputy and lead for the education and training working group on assets. So thank you for welcoming me today. Thanks so much for, for joining everyone. Um, and uh, as you said, Manuela is uh, still trying to join, but uh, if she manages to get on, we will uh, give her some time to introduce herself. So uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to run through a quick uh, couple of slides and then we'll move straight on. Uh, please ignore the hashtags. These are sort of out of date now. Um, but do follow me on Twitter as I don't have that many friends and always want more. Um, just a bit of context, really. So the Association of Surgeons in Training is the largest professional body that um, represents uh, all surgical trainees and uh, medical students interested in becoming a surgeon from all different specialties across the UK and Ireland. So uh, we really truly are pan specialty and pan and pan grade, which is um, really exciting. We have nearly 4,000 members. And uh, March last year, they, uh, the group introduced an innovation lead, which is supported by B. Braun, which is the role that I currently, um, I currently uh, help them out with. So just to give a quick bit of the, I guess, some of the background or some of the reason why ASSET felt it was necessary to have an innovation lead and why I think surgical innovation is absolutely critical. Uh, you can see from some of these statistics that uh, less than 6% of all devices has a surgeon as a co-inventor. And partly because of this, um, less than 10% ever reach clinical trial, which is often the pivotal stage to persuade policymakers to adopt uh, a new, new device or not. And hence the widespread adoption rate is incredibly low. And uh, compounding this, we've got increasing dependency on the use of technology, which is getting ever more expensive and complicated to use. For trainees and uh, indeed for students, uh, this poses a, uh, some unique challenges and in that uh, there's a recruitment and a retention challenge because we find it difficult to affect change that we, you know, in our working lives, we find it very difficult to uh, improve the situation for us, for our training, but also for our patients. So we feel very disenchanted and a lot of the time people do uh, sadly leave the profession in part because of this. And uh, this is, I argue, largely due to a lack of innovation skills. Uh, and uh, opportunities to develop uh, their, their innovation skills in, in the real world. And compounding this is a lack of interdisciplinary collaboration. And I really liked uh, Sir John's keynote talk where, uh, upon reflecting on his career, the, the lack of innovation skills and the lack of interdisciplinary collaboration were really the two central points that he felt uh, on reflection that really sort of posed challenges to his, uh, his career, his own career, which is, um, I think, quite validating. Um, so as innovation basically aims to overcome these barriers, we want to deliver some innovation skills, we want to deliver some real world opportunities, and we also want to foster interdisciplinary collaboration. So I, I don't just mean working with you know, surgeons with anaesthetists, I mean completely outside of medicine. So engineering, physicists, computer sciences, uh, and industry, of course, to name a few. Uh, we do lots of things. Um, we're about to enter into our second year, but uh, in the first year, we've done lots of innovation workshops. We've done 
uh, a virtual uh, innovation summit where we had uh, technology exhibits. So we had skills, courses on coding, 3D printing, social entrepreneurship. And this has led to a number of opportunities with industry, including partnerships with robotics companies and immersive technologies companies, which is really, really exciting. Um, really, our technology strategy just aligns uh, nicely with the Future of Surgery report, which was published a few years ago now. Um, and really, we're very interested in these kind of four main areas, and we're building industry partnerships and research projects with, within each of these. Um, but I'm not going to go on too much more detail. But if you do want to find any more, do follow us on uh, Twitter or, or um, go onto our website for all the latest details. Um, but that's what I want to say about ASSET for now. And I'll hand over to Will to do the same for MedTech. Thanks, Will. Um... That hasn't worked for me. Can you see that? Yeah. The slide? OK, excellent. Um, so I would say there are a lot of similarities between uh, our aims and what we do to as assets. Uh, we are the MedTech Foundation. We uh, perhaps look at a slightly earlier career stage, though, than, than Asset do. Um, so since you're here, you probably I probably don't have to give you much backstory about the, uh, the MedTech and in vitro diagnostic cooperatives, um, or the MIX, which exists all around the country. And of course, there's the surgical one in Leeds. Uh, we started as a, as a, a sort of a spin-off um, from the surgical MIC um, under Will's uh, direction um, about five years ago um, as essentially the, the student and trainee uh, sort of division of that. So uh, we're very much uh, um, looking at university students in the, in the main and some uh, junior doctors and, and junior uh, researchers. So we, we also are a national organization. Um, but we do have spokes all around the country, which you can see on the on the map on the right hand side there. Um, in terms of what we do, well, we do qu we do quite a few things now, uh, and increasingly more things at a national level. Um, quite a lot of these are collaborations. For example, we we have done stuff with Asset in the past, and we're doing more uh, in in the coming months. Um, but most of our stuff happens at the spoke level, uh, and the three core activities that go on at all our spokes. Are the, the innovation program, which I will tell you more about uh, on, a, on a subsequent slide, um, MedEx events, which are sort of uh, TEDx style talks uh, where we get um, pretty inspiring innovators from the world of MedTech to come and talk to um, our members about what they're doing and uh, to give everyone an opportunity to network and uh, facilitate cross talk between disciplines and between people at different stages of their careers. Um, and we also link uh, up students with uh, industry and, and help facilitate internships. But really, um, I want to tell you a little bit more about the innovation program because it's kind of a microcosm for everything that we're trying to achieve um, as the MedTech Foundation. Um, so these, these run in all our spokes. Um, each one operates slightly differently based on the sort of local environment. But uh, so this slide is taken from the Cambridge program. Um, so basically what we do is we take um, 36 students um, from across all different disciplines and actually they they were divided we just finished our program in cambridge and they were divided pretty much into quarters of medics engineers scientists and business people so we're really very much not focused just on medics but on on, on much wider um and at our first workshop we introduced them to three clinical problems which are suggested to us by three clinicians that encounter these problems on a daily basis uh, in their clinical practice and they get uh they get to choose what problem they want to work on they get put into an interdisciplinary team and they work on that project for 12 weeks uh, with the help of interactive workshops that we provide or well, we get our partners to provide. So, for example, they are taught about concept generation by clinical engineering innovation, which is the local hospital's sort of in-house engineering team. They get taught about business model by the business school and they get taught about pitching by a, by a BBC journalist. So uh, we really get some pretty um, amazing speakers to, to come in and give those workshops. We also give them small group mentoring um, by sort of, uh, clinical aspects, by clinicians, engineering, by engineers, business experts, come and uh, do some business stuff with them. Um, and it all culminates at the end of the 12 weeks where they, they write a, a report and they uh, deliver a final pitch event, which for us was actually last week. Um, very successful. We had all, all kinds of people there and a very um, expert panel of judges to, to give feedback on everyone's ideas. So the reason for telling you a little bit about this program is it's it's very much uh, encapsulates everything that we try to do as the MedTech Foundation. So for us, it's about getting people at an early stage of their career, uh, not just medics, but everyone that needs to be involved with medical device development from business people to engineers um, to scientists and, and onwards. 
uh, getting them at an early point in their career, introducing them to medtech, uh, and hopefully getting them inspired to get involved, and alongside that, equipping them with the kind of hard skills and soft skills that they need uh, to do so. So I think that's all I, all I wanted to say at this point. Well. Thanks very much, Will. So I hope that gives everyone who's uh, watching a bit of an overview of the two groups there and uh, put some context to what we hope to discuss. So we have a few we have a few points that we wanted to sort of discuss that we think are interesting and we'd, we'd love to hear other you know other people's uh, opinions on as well. But obviously, if you have some organic point, do let us know. So I think we'll just crack straight on really, and I'll just put it open to the panel to start with. Uh, happy happy for anyone to jump in, but. I think one of the common themes uh, throughout this event, and really the reason why it exists, is to try and break down barriers to interdisciplinary collaboration. We've got industry, we've got academics, we've got clinicians all in the same room throughout all of these breakouts, which I think is, you know, we might take it for granted, but I think is actually quite unique and, and uh, quite interesting. So from, from a student point of view, I guess, maybe Angela first, maybe from a student point of view, uh, in universities, we're often taught in silos, particularly medicine, we're taught as medics, medsoc are very clicky, for example, or whatever, and then you've got the different disciplines. You know, how do we break down some of these silos to improve interdisciplinary collaboration um, you know, for university students, really? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Will. It's a really important point about interdisciplinary collaboration and at an early stage in order to advance anywhere in terms of going forward with your career. Um, I graduated from the University of Cambridge and we're fortunate there that we have a collegiate system. So a lot of our, um, a lot of what we do in the social aspect is with other disciplines. And so we do have uh, that interdisciplinary collaboration uh, quite early on. But uh, in other universities, you often sit amongst your cohort um, in terms of your disciplines and it's quite difficult to get that collaboration, uh, especially at university stage. So it's definitely important. And uh, I think in the university stage, things like trying to integrate interdisciplinary collaboration in terms of projects, in terms of lectures would help. Um, it's not done at the moment. Um, Will Foster probably has more opinions on this because in our degree, we're allowed to have an integration where we can choose to do other subjects. In my third year, I did uh, a part of psychology, which I thought was actually probably the most interesting point in my career because I was mixing with a lot of different students. And um, there are people from a lot of different backgrounds, sociology, uh, the people who were doing psychology in the first place. And we had some others coming from uh, other science subjects and uh, English as well. And that really broadened my view in how to approach uh, certain research topics and uh, approach my medicine career, for example. Uh, and it was only through doing an intercalation that I was actually appreciating the advancement in my knowledge to be able to um, improve the way I think. So definitely at a university level, I think there is scope to have lectures among disciplines uh, and also to integrate further into interdisciplinary collaboration within our courses. Um, but I think Will Foster has a couple of suggestions as to how we might do that. Oh, yeah, I, I can jump in. So um, I, I was lucky enough to, uh, that in Cambridge, we were given the opportunity to pretty much have free reign with our third year and do what we like. And so I did engineering and fortunately managed to find quite a lot of areas where where engineering and medicine overlap. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to work in quite a few of those, medtech obviously being one, but also the research I do and, and other things as well. Um, so that's, I, that's a particular unique opportunity that we have at Cambridge. I, I think there are other ways that we could um, improve interdisciplinary collaboration in university. And I, I think it, it's got to go beyond uh, just being taught things, just being taught hard skills or having combined lectures. I think there's, in an ideal world, we'd have an opportunity for people to actually do things together. Um, and I think, um, I think there's definitely scope for doing that. Um, for example, in, in the engineering course, they have uh, projects which are open to them and some of them are quite actually sort of medtech focused and I see no reason why we couldn't get medics involved with doing those projects with them. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a medical degree there are opportunities that you have to pick what you want to do like your student selected components or electives. Um, why not have those working with other students um, in interdisciplinary collaboration to, to actually work on things together. I think that's really important at building up uh, a, a network of contacts um, as well is, is, um, 
I think hugely important, particularly at an early stage of your career. Absolutely. I think that's really, really insightful comments. And it's great that you've had those opportunities really. And, you know, obviously you're a self-selected sample, but it's great to hear that those opportunities are out there and you can go and find them. Um, Martin, I just wonder from a trainee point of view, I guess, um, you know, first of all, you know, what's your opinion on in surgeon, surgical trainees or indeed any clinical trainee working with someone from completely outside of healthcare? You know, um, do you think that should be a thing? And I guess if so, or, uh, you know, how, how, how best do you see it fitting in alongside or, you know, as well as all the clinical training commitments that we, we have? Yeah, it's a very interesting listen to Angela and William's perspectives. And it's very inspiring to hear that that collaboration is starting at an undergraduate level. Certainly, like everything, um, training has undergone a lot of challenges and difficulties the past year. Um, today's event kind of epitomizes the progress that's been made in sharing ideas and building networks. Uh, and, and creating that interdis interdisciplinary um, communication, which sometimes is quite challenging um, at university level when you're in a silo within the different schools, et cetera. So I think events like today have um, broken down those barriers. From a trainee point of view, for us as an organization over the past 10 months, certainly working with um, companies that support us over the past number of years has enabled us to continue to maintain um, our reach to our membership but also to provide the same quality of education that you would get at an in-person event. And um, yourself, um, Will, when you joined the organization, couldn't have joined at a more apt time because everything that we have done has been innovative. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been done before. And we're beginning to see the fruits of that in terms of the outcomes, the ability to kind of network and communicate and reach more people. And not just here within the UK and Ireland, but beyond that network. And that's important. Um, as you know, um, we, we kind of provide a lot of high quality educational courses for trainees, but to be able to offer that to people regardless of your geographical location is important. Mm -hmm. And certainly mm -hmm. from, 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 from today's conversation, you can begin to see that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, we can open this up. And from, from William's kind of um, presentation, you can see now in that graph, hopefully in the next 12 months, that graph will grow where, the, where those um, grips are, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. I think asset are sort of actually ahead of the curve when it comes to getting, you know, innovation activity right at the center of a lot of the strategy that they're trying to deliver, which I think a lot of groups could learn from, from, you know, outside of surgical specialties. Um, I guess just uh, one one thing I guess I'm really interested in, you know, when we, when we talk about interdisciplinary collaboration is the golden nugget really is for those that want it, who are taking part in a medical degree or in an engineering degree, a pure, you know, engineering degree, say, for those that want it, it would be great if interdisciplinarity was just part of the curriculum. It was just the way that they're taught. Um, obviously not all the time. I don't think it would work all the time because people have different calendars holidays you know and they need to learn their own skill sets as well but to have embedded opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration i think would be absolutely would be brilliant i think certainly in leeds one of the things we're trying to do now is we're introducing uh, the something called we're calling it the mbchb enterprise scheme which uh, enterprise i guess is a combination of entrepreneurship and innovation or at least that's what we're trying to we're trying to combine and here you know self-selected medical students if they do want to jump onto the scheme after their first year they actually learn the innovation skills alongside their um, medical degree by attending like specific workshops and specific uh, kind of like modules, although it's not a modular degree. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, you will we'll foster you talked about intercalation. They can go and intercalate in the business school if they want to get the more entrepreneurship side or if they want to get more innovative side, then there's a you know, research degrees where they can do innovation project. Um, so I guess just from a from a medical student point of view with the, with, with yourself, Will and uh, Angelo as a newly qualified doctor, um, you know, do, how do you think, do you see it being embedded in the curriculum in the way that we're taught? How do you think we can do that? So I think this is a conversation that MedTech Foundation has been having quite often lately about trying to integrate what we do in the innovation programme where we're actually bringing people from across disciplines into a programme and working on a project together uh, and trying to integrate that into the curriculum where we have our state. Um, at the Cambridge level, we've collated some statistics, uh, which I'm sure we'll can elaborate on a bit later. But a lot of the students who come for our programme say that uh, they have learnt uh, unique skills to do with interdisciplinary collaboration through our programme. Um, and we've recently been awarded by the University of Cambridge um, 
as highly commended for an outstanding contribution to education. So we are being recognized for uh, what we do. Um, and now what, what it's seen is at the moment is almost like an extracurricular activity, but most what people usually get out of it is just another CV point or something on their career portfolio. But what would be really nice would be to work with the engineering department, with the business school, with the clinical school of medicine, the school of clinical medicine, uh, to try and actually get some um, credit for their courses and actually integrate it into their career. Um, and that's something that we're looking towards. Uh, we haven't made, we haven't uh, actually done that yet, but we're looking towards and we're having discussions about doing that. I, think, um, I would add that there, there are maybe two things to consider and one is adequate opportunities for people that want to do med tech to get the opportunity to do it and then there's the other thing of people that haven't considered med tech to, to what extent should we force their hand and, and make them um, get involved or, or just give them the opportunity to see what it's like and I think it's, it's obviously difficult to, to, to put any kind of interdisciplinary um, into subject collaboration within um, courses, uh, but I think it's doable. And I think um, in Cambridge, at least, that I don't think it would take too much work to set up the opportunities for people that wanted them. So I think um, I know that there are, for example, that, um, clinical engineering innovation, which is uh, I mentioned in my presentation, they're the, the uh, local hospitals in-house engineering team. They are engineering students working with them uh, for a year, actually, because in, in fourth year on engineering, you do a year long project. Um, now, there's no reason that I can see why a medic couldn't get involved with something like that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think these kind of opportunities do exist for people that are interested in them. Then there's the, then there's the question of, well, and I, I think you could you could be really extreme about this and you could say that uh, in your in your fourth year, when you do uh, your surgical placement and your medicine placement and your acute placement, you could have spend a week in industry or, or something or spend a spend a week with the engineers at Adam Brooks or you know, obviously there'll be capacity issues with that, but you could just have a taster day where you see how other people that aren't medics integrate into the med tech system and, and what, what other people do and how you can work with them. And I think that would give people a huge amount um, and, and see where all these things come from that they use every day in their practice, but they hadn't really thought about. Yeah, no, fa fascinating. And I, I really, I really think med tech foundation should be, you know, right at the center of this conversation. It would be, it would be great to, drive a national sort of initiative really to try and get those kinds of opportunities i think all the suggestions that you've raised are really uh, important um you know just taster days for example we have taster days in different specialties when you qualify why can't we have taster days in totally different disciplines as well i think that would be really uh, really nice particularly for people who are just wanting to dabble and just looking at the um the chat bar just uh, mr matthews asked a question uh, he, he says, um, what work has been done to integrate an understanding of the underpinnings of medtech innovation that clinicians are typically rubbish at? For example, regulation, implementation, procurement, uh, and, and I'd, I'd add things, you know, intellectual property, for example, and collaborating with the industry, you know, often they're not great at it. Um, so, you know, I, I'd be interested to hear uh, everyone's views, but also, you know, Martin, you, you work with, you know, you have to, through your role with Asset, you're collaborating with, you know, lawyers and dealing with all the legal aspects and lots of contract, lots of things that are kind of like outside of your clinical training, I guess, and you've had to develop skill sets in that. So I'd be interested, you know, in a second just to hear about how you kind of did that, but um, just maybe why you sort of form your answer, I guess, from my, from my side, Mr. Matthew, you know, Part of it is what MedTech Foundation and what Asset are doing, we hope, with, with, with instilling sessions on things like, you know, uh, the regulatory pathways and so on. But uh, particularly at North, this being a Northern MedTech Summit, there is also the Translate MedTech um, uh, workshops and sessions, which I've attended uh, almost every year now for the last few years, which are great. Uh, they have a broad range of different ones. So there, there are sort of opportunities out there, but you're right. I guess it's not fully in integrated into clinical training. Um, the, the final thing I'll say on this is I think what it's important for every clinical innovator to have an awareness of the different things that you kind of need to be, you know, aware of, I guess, things like, you know, I, I need to know roughly what the regulatory pathway is or when to involve someone who might know more than me in that setting, you know, and actually you don't need to be an expert in every single stage. So it's just like, when do I need to talk to a lawyer about IP, for example, or when do I need to talk to someone about regulatory or when do I need to collaborate with industry? I think those are kinds of the meta skills that I think clinical innovators should develop. But, um, but I, that's just my two cents on it. But yeah, Martin, I don't know if you've got anything else to add on, on top of that. I, um, I'm 
enjoying kind of the, the conversation and the chat, as you say. I think this has hit the nail on the head in terms of what's important in this whole process. Certainly in, in his honor sec, um, coming into it as a non-business um, minded individual and solely clinical, there's a steep learning curve initially. But what is important is to have a really strong team around you and network. And that is not um, medics as a per se. And it's also important that whenever you do take on a role that you want to innovate or you want to change something, that you have a firm understanding of the processes that are involved um, from the get-go and a, a clear timeline and when to involve a certain individual. You mentioned there the legal aspect. That is that is important because that may be the overall downfall to your idea moving forward. And it also has a, a reputational risk involved as well um, if you don't take on that advice. And, and unfortunately, kind of with, like many ideas, they are good at the start and you put a lot of work into them, but they never materialize. And that's something hopefully by teaching people these skills at an earlier stage, we can minimize the the, the time that's lost of ideas um, certainly will. And with your role, um, the, the main aim is to inspire these skills and formalize this skill um, am amongst medics and to instill kind of in, in, in the next generation that it, it is really, really positive to collaborate and to communicate with different organizations because eventually it ends up in being um, a positive outcome for, for, for the patient as well as you as an individual. And earlier in the conversation, you mentioned, Angela, about um, CV and this being judged as extracurricular. I, I'm very much against that mindset and opinion on this. I see this as, as fundamental skills in, in, in the environment that we work in, in healthcare in particular. And a, a lot of these skills will, will, will help the system fundamentally that will benefit the patient. So I, I think we need to move away from that mindset of this being solely extracurricular and personal and that this will definitely benefit organizations moving forward. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Martin. Really, really, really interesting uh, points. I'm just, uh, I agree with you. I'm reading some of the clients. Richard Hall, who's, uh, uh, I guess, representing industry, uh, medtech industry primarily here, uh, was talking about, you know, how do we get academics and I guess also clinicians to overcome some of these familiar challenges. Um, and I think, you know, um, looking at the chat, you know, uh, Mr. Matthews, right, it's about um, lobbying these these groups who, who do who are supposed to train us things like medical schools the royal colleges you know and sort of showing them what we can do what we're doing you know what we have to do quote extracurricularly but you know the unmet needs there and people engage with it so we should make it integrated really i guess um angela or william any any other extra thoughts on on that so far yeah i couldn't agree more with both uh what martin and will you said and uh Ryan, you've, you've raised some really interesting questions. Um, and thank you, Richard, for your input. Uh, I think from, um, so I'm obviously at the very early stage of my career process, and at least what I've uh, appreciated so far is that uh, you've either got a, an academic career pathway that you go through in medicine or a clinical career pathway. Uh, and I think most uh, medics or most doctors that I've spoken to about sort of med tech uh, sort of view it as a side project, which again, I completely agree with Martin that it, that shouldn't be the mindset going forward. It's fundamental uh, to be able to advance uh, healthcare in the future. Um, perhaps there's room to actually have a curriculum that's centered around interdisciplinary collaboration, what different uh, disciplines can actually bring forward to this and why it's necessary and also to highlight an early stage the uh, pathway that one would take um, to create a device that would potentially medical healthcare in the future. Will, I'm not sure whether you had uh, anything further to add to that. Uh, no, not really. I, I completely agree with everything that's that's been said, um, and I, I don't I don't want to waste too much time by by just going over it again. I think it's a really good question. It's something we we should. Really at how we can actually formalize this as part of the education but ultimately I think it's still difficult to make that um, step from just sort of uh, academically having the skills or being taught these hard skills and actually being able to translate that into doing things as a student. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we do as MedTech Foundation is about giving people the skills so that they can then go on and do that in their future career and um, it would be very interesting to think about how we could ensure that people who are 
at an early stage in their career can actually do these things rather than just learn about them. I think that's a, another thing we can think about. Yeah, absolutely. Will I think I, you know, I'll pick you up on that actually, if I can. You know, this kind of you know bridging the gap between it being just an educational theoretical exercise, you know, which is important. You know, you need to have a foundation no level knowledge of of all these things, as we as we all seem to agree. Um, but it's about how do you translate that into real world action, real world innovation, real world opportunities. Um, you know, quite a lot of people, myself include, included, use things like the integrated academic training pathway, which clinicians can access um, to, you know, as a, as a vehicle, I guess, to do innovative activities, you know, through through research projects and through research on med tech or new technologies, I guess. So, uh, you know, there is there are there are some ways there, but I guess you have to be primarily, you know, at least, um, you know, you, you should be focused on the research aspect of things, I guess, fundamentally. Um, so, you know, any other thoughts from around the table, really, about how do we bridge this gap between just educating and then the real world opportunities? You know, we mentioned we mentioned a couple of things, but how do we make them integrated and more accessible, I guess? I certainly think. Sorry, go ahead, Will. Oh, well, OK, fine. Uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's really difficult. I, I think there are certain barriers you have at, um, at an early stage of your career that you don't have later. And I think. For example, if you're a full-time student, time to actually pursue something is difficult to do. Um, and so we've we've had teams that have come out of the innovation program in Cambridge who have had a really good idea, got really good feedback, got themselves onto a, a startup accelerator, and then just stopped because they wanted to focus on their, their academic studies and, and not really being able to do it. And those kind of problems are, are difficult things. I'm not sure how we can address them. Um, I, I think. Um, I think it's and it's also difficult for students to assess whether they've really got a very good solution and and how valid their problem is that they're working on and these kind of things. So I think it's really important that you have input from more senior people. Um, I, I'd love there to be an opportunity for people at at the student stage of their career to get involved with more senior people and work with them on things. And so I think that's where we could come in with student selected projects. At the moment, you know, you have a uh, a senior clinician might suggest a research project that you do or suggest some sort of audit that you do. Well, why not suggest a clinical problem to work on that you can work with someone and, and develop a technological solution? I think those are the kind of ways we could actually help people uh, in, a, in a real way implement their ideas that they've come up with. Um, over to you, Martin, sorry. Um, I'm just going to add, well, in terms of bridging the gap from a curriculum point of view, I think like most things, there has to be kind of a real analysis of what people's understanding of the importance of this is definitely at the moment we do see at, at the end of the at the end of the cycle where many of these um, innovations aren't really um, getting to the, the patient and getting finished but fundamentally in terms of even beginning the process how much of an appetite and interest are there and how much knowledge and skills do people currently have and I think like like most um, curriculum um, changes and improvements over the years, that's been the fundamental starting block is that it's been evidence-based. evidence, evidence based. And I don't think until we begin to understand the current appetites and kind of will for people to embrace this, will we begin to see actual um, integration formally. So I think from move, moving things forward, that's the next step and certainly something that we'll support kind of getting more information on that at the moment to drive the integration specifically. And, and fundamentally, hopefully that will get us, get us the, the right skill mix um, for, for the future. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Sorry, Angela, are you about to say something? Go on. Yeah, I, I thought that I uh, am going to say one of the big barriers uh, to getting disciplines to work with each other uh, in innovation and trying to integrate this into the, the career pathway is the fact uh, that people don't really understand the contribution that other disciplines can have because they haven't been through the discipline themselves. They don't understand uh, what um, expertise that they can bring to a certain project. So if, for example, you're a clinician, you identify an unmet need uh, in your career, you may not know who to approach, um, who's the best person or best sort of discipline to go to, to be able to move that idea forward. Uh, and I think, that can potentially be uh, addressed either in people's careers by openly talking about different disciplines that people work with or the different contributions that um, other uh, external organizations might have towards 
uh, the NHS or a medical technology, in, um, for example. Uh, but I wonder if there's any way to actually get that idea across at an early stage, so whether it be in the university or at an early career stage. Sort of yeah, no, really interesting. I think it's I think it's a really good point. You know, how do you collaborate with someone if you don't even know what page they're what page they're coming you know coming off? Um, maybe something like a disciplines showcase type event or something. Maybe that's something that we can sort of introduce. You know, I'm just bringing in some comments uh, that have sort of been happening in the background. Pete, Pete Colmer, who's a mechanical engineer at Leeds, a good good colleague of mine and a huge advocate for working with different disciplines, um, is basically fully agreeing with you, Angela, you know, about integration of different disciplines is, uh, you know, absolutely critical. And, uh, you know, through, through all of his med tech projects, he basically works with surgeons and doctors right from the start. And he so yeah, I think he'd be the first to say that that's one of the number one determinants of a successful project is that collaboration right at the start. Um, you know, and understanding the, which type of doctor to speak to, for example, is really important, but also from our side, is it a mechanical engineer or is it a robotics engineer? There's all quite kind of like different types, kinds of things. So I think, you know, I think MedTech Foundation does have a role in that. I think that is something that, you know, you guys can can advocate and champion. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, if anyone else has anything, anything to come back to on that as well. I'd certainly echo that sentiment. Well, I do think the MedTech Foundation will be, is crucial in, the, in this. Um, and to continue kind of leading, leading, leading on, on, on the subject matter, because until, until kind of we can begin to see this formally adopted, I think we, we will be constantly having this conversation. So the more we can kind of formalize this in, 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 in the sense of the curriculum and begin to ensure that it shouldn't see the benefits, um, Angela and, and Will, about integrating with different disciplines and how that will impact the clinical career. I think that's the key, the key thing is bridging that gap and seeing how the collaboration will benefit their clinical career that will begin to kind of move things forward yeah absolutely critical i mean R richard hall uh, has just said he 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 comes from industry his background so he's just said you know not all academics have a passion to innovate so i think that's i think that's important to realize you know with this session's about talking about the future of innovation and i think part of that is opening people's eyes to being an innovator, to going down that route as a career option and so on. Um, but also a recognition that not everyone learns in the same way, not everyone wants the same kind of career opportunities and that that's, that's okay. I think the, the whole point of both both groups, uh, you know, strategies really is for those that want opportunities, they should be accessible. So for those that wanna develop those skill sets, you know, people should be able to access them. Um, Pete Coleman's just mentioned that uh, it's also a good experience to work together and experience how a project can fail. Sometimes they should, but it's important to find out by fully. Yes, exactly. So, you know, learning from failure, learning from different disciplines, you know, experiences and stuff, I think that can really help, uh, you know, develop yourself as an innovator and a researcher. Um, we're coming to kind of coming to the end. We've kind of got five minutes until we have to start um, drawing it to a close. And um, I'm going to, I think my, one of my jobs is to summarize some of the discussion points here. So I've been frantically making notes and um, I will disseminate them to the organizers who will possibly share them on. So if anyone does have any last comments in the chat bar, do do drop them in. But I guess just, you know, I wonder, you know, to the panel as well, as we're, as we're coming to an end, the, the whole point of this really is, you know, looking at the future and obviously we're, we're a self-selected group and we're all kind of early career as well. So we recognize the, the importance of that. But, um, you know, really, I think any closing comments on how we maximize opportunities for early career people to, to really ensure the future of innovation is, is bright and, and can, continues to get brighter, of course. Um, my closing sentiment would be is to where you do have an individual that approaches the likes of medtech or assets or or you as a as a clinical entrepreneur to to encourage that um, that skill and to put them in the right direction and build a network. Um, whilst whilst the work behind the scenes of medtech and asset and other organisations continues to to fulfil that formally, and it's 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 in many ways the aim is to ensure equitable access for an individual regardless of, wh of where you are. And that, that hopefully will, will create ideas that will benefit um, people, people on a more global scale. Yeah, I, I will, I completely agree with that. And I think, um, I think I, I see that as, as the next thing we should be doing as the MedTech Foundation is to look at how we can um, influence the curriculum and, and make sure everyone has the opportunity to learn about these kind of opportunities and, and how they can work with other people. And, 
learn about how they can make a difference to healthcare rather than just being a part of it. And I think really we should have the same emphasis on medical students, on innovation, as we do on research. And at the moment when they get there, the, the forced time that they have to spend on performing an audit or doing some other area of clinical research, I don't see why the opportunity shouldn't be there for them to to have a go innovating as well and to get the opportunity to work with other students at an early stage of their career um, and get a taster for, for actually um, just brainstorming and, and having some ideas and, and trying to put a solution together. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with what, what uh, Martin and Will have summarised. Um, I guess I don't really have much to add apart from uh, some tangible points that we as the MedTech Foundation can take away from this. I think in terms of encouraging this at an early stage of people's careers, there's two ways that we can go about doing this. Uh, the MedTech Foundation could uh, create a curriculum themselves or actually integrate it into uh, the lecture series or the programs that we host across the, uh, for the university students and early career professionals. Um, and that's something that we can actively do and create. And the other side that we can do uh, is to actually talk to the larger bodies about actually integrating this into the university curriculum, uh, whether it be, for example, the Medical Schools Council uh, or um, individual parties within the university them themselves. So I guess we can take that away from this. Brilliant. I'm, I'm really excited to see what the MedTech Foundation does. And it's been great, you know, translating some of these uh, ideas into organizations, you know, an asset of, of obviously a huge part of that. So um, I think we're just coming to an end now. I think I just want to say thank you so much for, you know, my, my panelists, you know, that you're, I've learned a lot. I've found this very, very fascinating, very interesting. So thank you. And thanks to everyone uh, in the chat who's been engaging. This is, um, I hope this has been enjoyable um, and uh, your questions and comments were really, really stimulating. And I think we've, we've all taken a lot away from this. Um, I think the only thing that's sort of left for me to say now is that if, uh, you could head across to the virtual expo um, the of industry partners and, and different uh, innovations and uh, med tech companies for you to go and explore. Um, and there's uh, a couple more sessions uh, sort of as we move through throughout lunch. So um, so thanks everyone for your time and I hope you have a lovely rest of the, uh, lovely rest of the conference. Take care.